Hey everyone, and welcome to the January 2022 episode of Ask Shane Anything. This show is a reward for patrons who pledge at $7 or more per month. We do an, a monthly Zoom call where people come in and ask me questions, but really it just turns into a big podcast and it's fun. If you want to get it on the fun for February, again, just pledge at $7 or more per month. You can be a part of it. Everyone gets to watch the archive of the show. And with that, Let's get on with it. We're going to kick things off with Jay Lynn, who is the first person to show up today in our Zoom call. How are you doing, Jeff? Doing great. Thanks. Happy man. New Year to you, man. Happy New Year. Got a question for me? I do. Um, in the last Pactor Factor, he talked about um, how he quit one of his jobs because his boss was unethical. Yeah. I was wondering if you ever quit your job, quit a job, and um, what was the worst job experience you ever had outside of Sifted? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, what I thought was also interesting in that episode with a Pactor Factor was how he mentioned that he downsized himself. Did you pick up on that? He was like the head of like finance at some company and they were going to do a huge round of layoffs. And he laid himself off and took the package. <laughs> it was funny when I was recording it, like a lot of times I'm looking at my notes or something and I'll miss some things that he says. And I totally missed that until we went to edit the show. And I was like, what? He fired himself? Like, that's pretty crazy. He must have really hated working there. That's all I can say. Um, I have quit jobs before. I'm not very many, though. Well, no, that's not true. I mean, I've quit tons of jobs, but a lot of times it was because I got an offer at another job somewhere else. Um, as far as just like having a job and hating the job and quitting it, that hasn't happened to me very often. Most of the times that I leave, leave a job is because I have another job or another project that I want to pursue. But my very first job that I ever had is probably the only job that I ever quit because I hated the job. And it was working at Pizza Hut. <laughs> my very first job was working at Pizza Hut. And it was a brand new Pizza Hut that was opening up in this little town, Carlisle, PA, where I'm from. And um for whatever reason, just me and all my skateboard and punk rock friends caught wind that they were hiring a ton of people and all of us just went in to interview. And it was like a group thing where like everybody who was interested in working there showed up at the restaurant and there's like 20 of us or whatever. And it was like a seminar for Pizza Hut where they explained what the job was going to be and, you know, how many people they're going to hire and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I get hired. And at first I'm like, oh, okay, I don't want to be a waitress. So I'm like, I'm probably going to make pizzas. And you go through this crazy training. First of all, I'll just tell you, Pizza Hut pizza is about as unhealthy a thing as you could ever eat. So anecdote that I'll tell you from training there, pan pizzas. So they get out the pan for the pan pizza and they're getting ready to throw the dough in it. Before they do that, they take these huge tubs of oil. And every time you push on it, they call it a squirt. In each pan of the, each pan for a pan pizza, there were 15 squirts of oil. So literally the oil is probably a quarter of an inch deep in the pan. And then they throw the, the dough in there for the, it is so bad for you. So anyway, I'm like, all right, I'm going to be making pizzas or whatever. This job isn't so bad. I'm working with all my friends for whatever reason, they ended up making me the dishwasher. I have no idea why. I'm like, wait a minute, why am I the dishwasher and every one of my friends are making pizzas? So anyway, the dishwashing there is an awful job. Not just the pans or whatever, but the silverware is a big pain in the butt. What they did there is they would take all the silverware and put them in a big silver like pan. And then you would put three caps of this whatever in the water with the silverware and it would eat all the food off the silverware. All you had to do is leave them in there for like an hour and a half and then just rinse them off and the food just wiped right off of them. And that was also what we used to wash the dishes. And literally it ate the skin off of my hands. By three weeks or a month into it, I had gone down to like the third layer of skin on my hand and my hands were raw. And I went in and I'm like, yo, I'm like, my the skin is being eaten off of my hands. And they were like, well, too bad. And I quit. <laughs> they wouldn't give you they wouldn't give you gloves. <laughs> they didn't want to hear anything. They're like, whatever, there's 50 other people waiting for these jobs. So I quit. I had earned enough to buy a new skateboard deck, which was back then was like 60 bucks or whatever. And I was like, I'm good. <laughs> I just quit. And then the next like week, like one of my mom's friends gave me a job working in a gas station at the just ringing like up the convenience store stuff. 
I ended up working there through like my whole high school or whatever. So that is the one job that I have just straight out like, I quit. Take this job and shove it. I quit. Otherwise, not really. And then what's the second part of your question? Something about a job that is unlike Sifted or something. I'm sorry, I forgot. Oh, um, you, you pretty much answered it. I was just wondering what your like worst job experience, the worst job experience you ever had. Oh, that is definitely it. Um, I also, when I was in college, I was a valet outside of Philadelphia in this area called Maniunk. And it's known as like the rich, ritzy area of Philadelphia. It's actually outside the city, right off the Schuylkill Expressway, which is like the little highway that connects Philadelphia to the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And I worked at a, at a like row of restaurants there as a valet. And that job was also awful um, because there was no umbrella. There was nothing to stand under. So when it rained or snowed there, you just got rained and snowed on. And it was also awful. But I didn't quit that job. Eventually, the valet company I worked for got fired and everybody lost their jobs. So that one, I may have quit that one eventually, but I didn't. That, respect your valets, by the way. If you live anywhere where there's crappy weather, it's a really awful job. Um, and like you'd be pouring rain and you get in someone's car or you go and get someone's car and come back and they'd go to sit down in it and they'd see like a little bit of water because you're drenched. They'd see a little bit of like water residue in their car and they flip out. And I'm just like, what am I supposed to do? I'm drenched. Like, there's, you want me to put on a pair of dry clothes every time I get a car? Like, it was an awful job. And people never tipped like ever. And that's where you're supposed to make all your money. Never do it. Never valet. If you ever ha run into a valet in your life, treat them like gold because that job sucks. Um, Gregor, do you have a question for me? Of course I do. That's why I'm here. Awesome, man. Well, so um, that we've had people show up and just listen sometimes too. So you never know. Okay, sure. Um, so um, you talked uh, about uh, you have former colleagues, I think, uh, ending up as game designers. And you've also mentioned that uh, you don't think you would be a good game designer. Did I get that right? Well, I never, I probably wouldn't be a good game designer, but I've never no, said no, that. No, no. So, so my, so I just don't is, want like, the job. Yeah. Yeah. So what, why, why do you, why do you think you wouldn't be a good game designer if, if I understood it correctly? Mm -hmm. um, because I think like as a journalist, you play tons of games and you analyze them to death saying like this mechanic works, this mechanic doesn't work compared to this game again, this game. So a journalist, it seems like they would be great game designers if they wanted to. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts like on that? Yep. Okay. So first of all, I did not say that I wouldn't be a good game designer. That's not why I don't want to do it. Um, and I may be terrible. I don't know. I could be the next Miyamoto. I don't know. I just don't want to do the job. Um, because of my job as a journalist, having talked to these people who make games for the last 20 plus years, just being perfectly honest, I haven't come across a lot of people that were really happy. Um, at a lot of like game review events when they used to do those before COVID, um, you would play the game all day. And usually at night, they would also have like kiosks set up to play like multiplayer or whatever, but then they'd also have a bar. Um, so like you play the single player through the day usually. And then at night it was more free and open and you'd sit around with other journalists and play multiplayer with the bar and drinks and food and everything. And, um, Almost every one of those events, I would have a chance sitting at the bar, sipping a drink, and one of the people who worked on the game would come up and sit next to me. And a lot of those conversations start with, okay, everything's off the record. And once you say that, then they talk. And they're mis they were miserable, all of them. They were all just like, oh, my God. Like, they had no joy of finishing the project. It was relief. Like they were just like, oh my God, I can't believe we dragged this thing across the finish line. But it's great because like it's this weird dichotomy where they are just ground to a pulp and they're depressed and they're not excited about their game releasing. But they have the PR people at that same event telling them, you got to be excited. Like when if anyone just randomly talks to you about the game, you have to make it seem like it's the work of your life and it came out exactly how you wanted it to be. And when you say to the developers, this is off the record, they tell you the truth. And I honestly have never met a single developer at that point of development where they had just wrapped the game, where they were happy. It's all just a sense of relief. And I'll say this too, at those events, they get hammered. 
they get sloppy, sloppy drunk. And I don't blame them a bit because it's grueling. The job is just grueling. Um, and I'm not afraid of work, obviously. I've been running a website by myself basically for the last seven years. So I'm not scared of work. It's the type of work and the demands and the irregular schedule. Um, at least like when I work as a journalist, I know I'm gonna work long hours, but I know that most of those hours are gonna be from like nine to 10 in the morning until five to seven at night. When you're a developer, that's just not how it works. You're basically on call. You know, if, you, if they're working on a part of the game and they're like, okay, we got all this done, but we need input from Shane. They call Shane at like 1.30 a.m. And they're like, yo, we're waiting on you for this thing. Like either you need to come in and look at it or we can try to describe it to you or we can put it up on screen with this video sharing program that we have. It is just a 24 hours a day job for, until you finish the game. And I just, I never saw people that it seemed like they liked working in it. And then you even see people who have a lot of success. Um, David Jaffe and Corey Barlog come to mind. They release their opus and then they quit because they just don't want to do it anymore. Look at David Jaffe. He got to God of War 2. He finished it. And he's like, I'm done. I want nothing to do with this anymore. I'm going to go take a break and see what happens. And we all know what happened. Corey Barlog finishes God of War 2018. He's not, de he's not the lead developer on God of War Ragnarok. He's like, nope, killed me. I have to sit it out. And I just look at that and I'm like, I couldn't imagine working on one project and having it affect my opinion of my job so much that I didn't want to do it anymore. I just, it's just not appealing to me. Uh, to ask your question of whether journalists would be, are, or would be good or bad game developers. I tend to agree with you. Um, I think that they have a very keen eye for not only what makes the game good or bad, but also what's going to make a game sell or not sell. Um, and I think, a lot of journalists do go into development and a lot of people get into journalism for the pure purpose of going into development. Like their, their dream isn't to become the editor in chief of a website or to become the supervising producer of the video arm of the website. Their goal is to get in there, meet people and network in the industry and get a job working at Nintendo or Sony or Microsoft or 343 Industries or Bungie or wherever, whatever game that they really like their entire lives. That's their goal. Um, and so some of those people do go into development, but what some of them also do is they use the skills that they learned as a journalist to work kind of in game development by being consultants, uh, by doing mock reviews. Um, when I first left, let me see if I can remember. When I first left GameSpot and I moved to Tech TV to work on Extended Play slash X Play with Adam Sessler, I had like a two week period where I was like just laid off in the middle where they were waiting to get like my desk ready at tech TV and all this other crap. So I just two weeks where I was like just doing nothing and just hanging out. And I had three or four PR people email me and be like, Hey, we know you got a little downtime. We're wondering if you might want to write some mock reviews for us. And I was like, no, I'm like, that's a huge conflict of interest for a journalist to on the sly, basically review your game. Cause that's what a mock review is. They send you an alpha build or a beta build and you review it. You play it through, you write a review, you send it to them. They come back with questions about your review and like, how important was this? Did this really bother you? Just bother you a little bit, that type of stuff. Um, and then there are consulting firms. Now uh, there's one called Hit Detection, which is probably the biggest in the industry right now. Um, and a lot of ex Game Informer, ex IGN guys are all a part of that. And they are a more formal take on the mock review. They do the same thing. They get early code and they play it and they organize their thoughts, but their reports are far more extensive. Like when they finish with your game, they deliver like a PowerPoint presentation and talk about the different elements of the game, how they would tweak them, um, whether it's worth taking the time to tweak them or not. It's just a huge analysis. So there's a way to kind of dip your toes in both ends of it. And so if I were to ever work in development, that's as close as I would get to it would be like to launch my own consulting firm um, where I'm just consulting on games, but I don't have to deal with like the day-to-day -day of actually working on a development team um, and kind of getting the best of both worlds because you're still getting to play the games early like a journalist, but you're also making connections with the publishers and the industry at large. So I think that's a good way for journalists to get into development without completely kind of sacrificing. Uh, like people who work at a consulting firm I would probably still hire them as an editor. 
I would say that. Um, even though you may say, oh, that's a conflict of interest. They were consulting on Ubisoft's games or EA's games, and now you're going to let them review Ubisoft's or EA's games? As long as they're not still getting paid by those guys, absolutely. That's where the conflict of interest comes in. So as long as they're not on the payroll of those places, I would be okay with uh, letting them evaluate games. So that's kind of how I look at it. Like I am not interested in working at, and I, I mean, this, this video will live forever. And maybe there's some day where I'm like, hey, I'd like to work at Naughty Dog. And they're like, hey, there's this video that we found of you saying you never want to work here. Um, but generally like going into a development studio and working 40, 50, 60 hours a week on a game, it's, it's not as fun or as exciting as people think it is. It's better than working a job as like an accountant or whatever. Um, but it's not like, I think people think about game development. They think about what they see on TV, on like Ubisoft's like sitcom or whatever. It's just people walking around telling jokes all the time and shooting Nerf guns at each other. That's not how it is, man. Like it's a job. You go in and you sit at your desk and you grind out whatever it is that you do all day long. Um, so I think there's a misconception of what it's like to develop games. I don't think it's a total secret because you hear a lot of developers complain like Corey Barlog or David Jaffe. Um, but I do think there's a misconception about how fun and exciting it is to make games because the other part of it too is the, there's no immediate gratification. One thing I like about my job now is like, like I'm getting ready to launch a new podcast. If I, when I launch it on Monday and if you guys like it, I get this endorphin rush. I get this awesome feeling. You don't really get that in game development until the project's done. And then you may put it out and people may hate the game. Imagine working on something for three years and you go online the day it releases and there's just people like us just trashing it. Think about what that's like. So there's just, the reason I don't want to work in game development is because I know game development too damn well, if I had to put it into a sentence. Any follow-ups? No, I was going to ask about mock reviews, actually, but you covered that already. So <laughs> do, you have a do you have a question about them? Because I've, I've, I know a good no, my, bit about My them. question was uh, kind of like, if you ever uh, had a request for it, mm. um, and or if you knew someone, but obviously you, you do. So uh, yeah, that was my follow up. Or and I'll be honest, there are a mind. lot of journalists who have jumped back and forth who were doing mock reviews and also reviewing games for websites like FHM or for men's magazines like FHM and kind of those trashy like not quite Playboy mags that used to do game reviews. I knew several guys who wrote for those types of publications and were also doing mock reviews, which is totally wrong and a conflict of interest. One guy I know did a mock review for Eternal Darkness back in the day and then wrote a review for it in a magazine based off the code that Nintendo had sent him for his mock review. Yeah, and that's really bad. That guy actually isn't even in games journalism anymore. He works in some other sector now or whatever. So there are issues with it and it's hard sometimes to know what people are doing if they're not telling you because mock reviews are low key. They just send you an email. Some PR person's like, hey, want to do this? Like when I left um, game, game trailers, I got tons of emails for the first like three days after I left being like, hey, like, what are you doing? Do you want to come and do reviews for us or being a consultant for us? I'm like, no, 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 I have plans. Like I left for a reason. Um, but like they know, like the industry knows who's good, I guess at the end of the day, like they know who give game, who gives games a fair shake. They know which journalists can find the good and the bad in games and they flag you. And like when they think you're available, you know, you'll get an email from them being like, hey, you ever thought about doing this? And they're not being insidious or anything. They're trying to help. You know, they don't know. They didn't know I had a plan to start a new website and all this stuff. They're just like, hey, you left game trailers and you didn't announce that you have a new job. So you think you might want to do this? Like, so it was cool. And I appreciated that they did it. They're just looking out for me. Um, but I said no. And um, as of right now, I would still say no. Uh, but I, I guess another thing I would add is like a lot of people ask, like, how much do people get paid for mock reviews? From what I've heard, it's like two grand somewhere around there. Um, for I've heard some, for some bigger games, you make it closer to like five grand. Uh, but that also requires like back and forth after it's you've sent in your review, um, or, which is really what it is. It's just a review. Um, and so there, you're not going to get rich doing it, but you can make a living doing it. If you get, well, actually, you could do pretty well. If you got three $5,000 games a month, 15 grand a month, you're making almost 200 grand a year. That's not too bad. So um, 
it's a secret world of the video game industry that most people uh, don't talk about and some people don't want to talk about, but you know me, I'll talk about anything. Um, okay, Lestevad, you got a question for me? Yeah, for sure. Actually, uh, we've established just... now that you, your username on Twitch is, in fact, La Steve D. We talked about exactly. that before we went live. Yeah, so yeah. I've been calling <laughs> you the wrong name for the last like six years. So my apologies, yeah. man. Yeah, thanks, man. So, uh, yeah, so my question is, do you think it's fair for um, like for companies like Microsoft that have all the money in the world, whatever, to do what they did this week? And in a sense, what I'm saying is that um, do you think it's going to stop one day or do you see like indie companies just coming in and becoming bigger and becoming the next Activision or, or so forth? Because it seems that you've you've not heard of a new prominent studio in the past decade, right? It's always the, the, the old studios that we know from the N64, from the, you know, from, from whatever, from that era that are, that are still here basically. And no, no one came up basically, that's what I mean. Okay, I would disagree with that. Um, I think the clearest example, and I mentioned this on Game Phase, is Housemark and Returnal. I mean, think about, think about the launch of the PlayStation 4. And it launched that little shooter called Resogun that everybody got for free with their PS4 at launch. And everybody loved. And they're like, wow, this is cool. I got this for free. I ended up playing that game more than probably the whole PlayStation 4 launch lineup. So I don't think I'm alone there either. But they were just a little indie developer. Now, flash forward to the end of the PlayStation 4 generation, and they're snatched up by PlayStation. And for over, like, I think it was over $100 million, if I'm not correct, or if I'm, if I'm correct. Um, so some of them do. I do agree with you, though. It is rare. It doesn't happen as often as it should. But I would also argue that that's up to the studios and the teams to make games that bigger publishers are enthralled with enough that they're willing to make a big investment on buying that studio. Um, we were, you know, tooting Housemark's horn for like three years. People would ask us at the end of Game Face, like, what studio, if you could acquire a studio, would you acquire? And we always said Housemark. And then what happens? Eventually, Sony buys Housemark. So I do think it happens. I do agree with you, though. It doesn't happen as often as it should. Yeah. To your question about Microsoft and whether it's fair for one company to have so much money that it can just essentially buy success. I mean, let's be honest. That's what it's doing. And I would say, like, do you believe in capitalism or not? You know, I mean, that's really what it kind of comes down to. Either you're a capitalist and you agree with the way it works or you don't. Um, I love some parts of capitalism. I would really love capitalism if Sifted exploded. <laughs> but I think for a lot of people who, who live or work on the margins financially, I think they don't like capitalism because it is rich get richer. Like, for example, the stock market. Like, it's not hard to get rich in the stock market. It's not. Like, you literally can just buy stocks and let them sit there and just watch it explode. And the problem is, you need to have money to buy the stocks in the first place. And it's like, oh, we'll buy 500. Like, I think what a lot of people have learned with Robinhood. Are you, are you, are you guys familiar with Robinhood? Yes, I'm familiar with it. Yep. Okay. But for those who don't know, it's basically an app that lets anybody trade stocks. And I think that was a good first step towards getting kind of the layman into the stock market. But I think what a lot of people have realized who have started dabbling in stocks with, with Robinhood is that it's not a get rich quick scheme unless you have a lot of money to start with. Like when Robin Hood launched, I just did an experiment. Like I just took $500 and I just put it into Robin Hood and I picked, I read some articles and picked the stocks that most analysts were saying, these are going to rise over the next couple of years. And I didn't do a ton of research. I was like, okay, these guys are the experts. I'm going to trust them. And I just bought a ton of stocks with that 500 bucks. Like two months ago, it was up to a thousand. I had doubled it in like a year and two months, roughly. And now it's down to like 620 or whatever. But my point is somebody who did what I did, they're going to be, all they're going to learn is a hard lesson of capitalism. They're going to be like, okay, I'm here 14 months later and I've doubled my money, but I still only have $500. If you're wealthy, you put in $5 million. Now you have $10 million. That's capitalism. It's so much easier to maintain wealth once you're wealthy. You have to be an idiot not to, in all honesty. You have to be stupid to be broke if you've ever had a decent amount of money in America. Right. And that's right. kind of a positive of capitalism. It's like once you get over that hump, 
you're good, you're gravy. It's getting over the hump. And unfortunately for too many people, that's just out of reach. So to tie it back to Microsoft, it's that's capitalism. Microsoft started as a little dinky company with Bill Gates and two of his bros in a garage. I don't know if that's true, but I'm assuming it's something similar to that. I think that's actually an Apple story. Um, but he, it was started as this little dinky startup that people believed in and they busted their ass for the first five years like I have on Sifted and they put 70, 80, 90 hours a week into Microsoft and people told them they were crazy and they should quit and they had to take out credit cards and max those out to live. Like all this stuff that you do to start a business, it's the sacrifice with the hope at the end is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And it, most people, that pot of gold never shows up, but for some it does. And so when it does, I, it's hard for me, again, as, as a business owner, someone who started a business, it's hard for me to fault them because I always look at it like, well, look at you, look for you example, you started a liquor business. What if your liquor explodes and it becomes like the next hot thing and like you can't even keep up with it anymore and you're filthy yep. rich? Like, am I going to blame you for that? If you then find some other small liquor plate like companies and you buy them up to, to make your brand bigger? Hell no. So it's capitalism. Either you love it or you hate it or you're indifferent to it, but that's what's happening right now. And so I have a problem faulting Microsoft for winning when playing by the rules. Now, if I find out right. later on that they did something shady in these deals or somehow at some point Microsoft like screwed over a bunch of their stockholders to improve their company or something like that, then I may reevaluate. But right now it's just, it's fair play. And I just feel like the people who are really pissed off about it are the people who liked Call of Duty or liked one of Activision's other games. And now they realize that they're probably not going to come to their, the console that they decided to right. buy. So, and it's right. hard in this industry to figure that quotient into everything. Like how much is it just angry fanboys? I mean, seriously, it's the same thing. If you like, um, if you're really into sports and you go on Twitter, like when you read people's takes, it's very hard to tell whether they're just like a psycho fan of the team or if they really believe what they're saying and there's really, it's like rooted in reason and data and evidence. Like it's, I don't like that it's possible to, for Microsoft to just buy its way to the top. I'll be honest. Like, I always feel like hard work should come first and it's not like they're not working hard or anything, but I would argue that their games just really aren't as good as PlayStation's games and they're using their money to overcome that. Um, I would prefer to see them just all of a sudden Hellblade 2 is the greatest game I've ever played or Avowed is the best action RPG I've ever played or Starfield is Bethesda's best game ever. I'd prefer if they did it that way, but I'm not going to begrudge them if they did it the other way because they did pay their dues before um, back when they were a small company. And now these other companies are just getting into the mo. you know, not that Bethesda is a small company, but it's smaller. Um, and Bethesda was working its way up towards Microsoft and Microsoft decided to buy it. So I really have problems begrudging Microsoft for anything it's done here. It's trying to compete. It's trying to give players great value for the money. Nobody can argue against that. You're going to be able to play Call of Duty for $13 a month. Like, it, So ultimately, again, if it's good for the consumer and Microsoft is playing within the rules, I literally have no problem what, whatsoever with what it's done. And I would argue that most people who do have a problem with what's happening are just pissed off because they own a PS5 um, or decided to buy a PS5 instead of a Series X. As I said on Game Face, it would have been nice if we had got this news before everyone started buying their next consoles. Um, But that's not how business works, unfortunately. So there are some people who are big Call of Duty players who are like, crap, man, like I got a PlayStation. Everyone told me to get a PlayStation 5. Shane told me to get a PlayStation 5. (laughs) And now I can't, seriously though, like I think about that stuff and I can't play Call of Duty now because I listen to Shane, this guy, that I'm giving $4 a month to, to help me make smart purchase decisions. Like, so it is what it is. <laughs> I find myself saying that a lot these days with a lot of different topics. Um, it is what it is. It's capitalism, it's business, it's Microsoft being smart and Microsoft getting tired of sitting back and not doing something with the resources that it has. So I, I, find, I struggle to fault Microsoft for that. I guess my follow-up to that would be the way that I, that I see it is, um, I don't know if you agree, but like it seems like money now is buying games, and the creative creativity is like. I'm not going to say that it's out the window because there's a lot of indie games, there's a lot of like you know new stuff happening, but I just feel that 
you know, like um, we live in a world of Call of Duty. We live in a world of Halo where, yes, the game still might be good, might be enjoyable, but nobody's pushing the barrier. I'm just going to give you an example. It's uh, I saw the new Spider-Man movie, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I was able to see it before they closed down the, the movies here in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, <laughs> but uh, coming full but, circle uh, again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, but everybody was raving about it. Mm -hmm. Like it was like oh it seemed my like most God. people liked it. I haven't seen it yet, so but it seems so, like most people really like it. So no spoilers. People loved it, and you know, like there's a lot of rumors about it and whatever, you know. So mm -hmm. it, it is what it is. I came out of that movie and I was like, well, that wasn't good. No, you didn't like right? it. Yeah. So basically, and again, it's not, I'm not saying that the, the, the special effects were not good. I'm not saying that Tom Holland's acting was not good. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying as a movie that's tied into the Marvel universe, I don't, I don't, I don't think that did it. Right. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and you have, and, and I feel that in games, it's the same thing, right? You're trying to tell people like, yeah, this game is basically the copy paste of whatever. But now you feel that, yeah, money, they're just putting money in things that they know they're gonna, it's going to work. And, and that's it. And there's no creativity, like or creativity. It's, it's just, uh, that's the way I feel when I see Microsoft doing this. Well, I'll put it to you this way. Yesterday, Jeff Keighley on Twitter ran a poll. Um, and the question was, what old ip would you like to see microsoft revive from activision and like really the question is like i would have asked is what new ip do you think microsoft should develop with these teams that it has right but people are only interested in reviving the past like i always i say this all the time if there's not a market for it it won't happen but the sad truth is when they keep remaking these old franchises or rebooting these old franchises most of them do very, very well. Yeah. And again, it's a vote with your money type deal. If people don't buy these remakes or these remasters, they won't make them. But people are it a lot. Um, and it's easy money. It's low hanging fruit for these for these publishers. So they're going to do it. Now, I would argue that those projects are easy to handle. And you can have a team like Bluepoint or whatever that kind of handles that stuff for you while you continue on with like your new IP and your new ideas kind of parallel with that development. It doesn't seem like most studios do that. They're dead. They're putting their A teams on these reboots, remasters, remakes, whatever you want to call them. Um, but it was striking to me that Keeley, who is kind of a beacon in the games industry, he has a pretty good read on the pulse. His poll was like, what old franchises do you want to revive? And there was like 5,000 responses to the poll and like 900 comments. And to be honest, I replied to it and I said, pitfall. Um, <laughs> Seriously, revive Pitfall and make it a competitor to Uncharted. Yep. Like, there's IP there, but I still would rather see a new game with new ideas of than course. Pitfall dragged out of the trash bin from the Atari 2600 <laughs> days. Um, but that's where we're at. And I got a bunch of replies to Pitfall. People were like, yeah, you could do this, or, oh, that's a terrible idea. But people cared. And I'm just like, this is a bizarre world that we live in. But you're right. This, we, it is stymieing innovation. Um, you're just going to have to continue to count on exper experiencing new ideas in smaller indie games where you may have to fight through some other parts of the game that are annoying or that you don't like just to try to check out this new mechanic or this new way of doing things or this new control scheme you haven't tried before, that type of stuff. It's all happening in indie games. And to kind of go back to an earlier question about how indie developers are you know, not getting snatched up or whatever that's kind of the natural cycle of things because if you're a small indie studio and you come up with this crazy idea that works and everybody universally loves it, you might get snatched up or at the very least a bigger studio will steal your idea. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably far more likely. Let's be honest. Oh you, my can't, God. you can't uh, copyright like gameplay stuff. Gameplay yeah, that's mechanics. True. So that's true. It's like some stuff is just fair game to be stolen and taken. And that's also kind of the society. Like we live in this like sample society now where you're just taking little bits and pieces of all the stuff you like and then putting them in your own brew and brewing it up and seeing what you come up with. I kind of like that. Like I liked music a lot more when you could afford to use samples in music. Now it's so expensive, like hardly anyone samples anymore in music. Um, but in games, 
there's really no rules or laws that, that are prohibiting it. So it just happens over and over. And the hope is that some of these smaller studios eventually get rewarded for this stuff beyond just how well the game itself sells. But that's definitely not a given. Um, I actually had a follow up question regarding um, the idea that um, you can't fault Microsoft for paying for success. OK. And I don't I don't know how much money Microsoft has, but more than they... you can fathom. <laughs> what if they bought, what if they just bought Sony? Like, you know what, Sony, you're doing too good. I want, I want that. And then just bought Sony. You mean the PlayStation business or Sony in general? Because that's a big deal because Sony has consumer electronics that honestly, they're doing great now, but in the past they've generated far more revenue than the PlayStation brand. Are you saying just buying PlayStation from Sony or buying yeah, the whole Sony Corp? I just meant PlayStation. Okay. Um, then it would be bordering on a monopoly and there would probably be antitrust issues. So that is where I would draw the line. Like I'm not cool with Microsoft buying every company so that the only console you can ever buy is an Xbox. And the only place you can ever play any game is an Xbox. There's a limit to it, um, but there are laws in place to limit that. And if they do overstep their boundaries, the FCC or whatever organization that monitors that stuff will come after them and you know hopefully set it right. So there are fail safes in place to prevent that from happening. But if it ever were to happen, I would not be happy about it, honestly, because both of those companies excel at certain things. Like Sony makes amazing third person action games. It's their wheelhouse. It's what they do better than anyone else. Microsoft is terrible at it. Think about it. When's the last good Xbox exclusive that was a third person action game? Hellblade? It's... Maybe an action game. It's more of an adventure game. But think about it. Sony and PlayStation has all these franchises where you know what the character looks like. And they're on the screen the entire game. And they're in cinematics the entire game. Microsoft has none of that. All its games are first person. It's really bizarre. Um, so it's, a, it's definitely a detriment to the Microsoft library that it doesn't have games like that. But I would argue with all these studios that you have, figure it the F out. Like... That is your weakness. So take these studios and all this IP that you got and start making some good third-person action games because that's what it needs to compete with versus, as you said, just buying PlayStation, which does make perfect sense because they snap in just like a puzzle piece. The missing gap of Microsoft's genres, Sony snaps right in there. Like it would be perfect, but it would also be illegal. And so ultimately I believe the laws um, would keep it from happening, or at the very least, they'd try to make it happen and they end up having to like break up the companies anyway. So I don't see that ever happening. Now, let's say hypothetically, Microsoft buys Ubisoft and Take Two and EA. That also to me would start, it, the, the red lights would start going off at that point. I would be like, okay, like you guys are overstepping your boundaries now. You're forcing me to own an Xbox. Like right now, that's not the case. No one's forced to own an Xbox because they bought Bethesda or because they bought Activision Blizzard. There's still plenty of other studios making games for all the other platforms. You give them like three more, two or three more of the big publishers, then it starts to get a little dicey. So that's probably where I would draw the line. Like I would be okay with probably one more big acquisition, whether it be UB, EA, or Take-Two. One more than that, though, that's when, to me, it starts to get a little unruly. And I don't think Microsoft would even do that either. Um, Phil Spencer is legitimately a good guy, and he's legitimately a player like us. And he legitimately cares about the health of the industry in general, not just him. That's why they do stuff with Nintendo. I mean, what other reason would Microsoft allow a banjo game to appear on a Nintendo console? It just thinks it's good for its brand. Because Nintendo fans are like, wow, like, Microsoft let us play banjo on my switch. Wow. Like I can't believe it builds positive mental equity for everyone involved. PlayStation has yet to figure that out. Maybe someday it will. Um, but as of right now, it's completely adverse to the whole concept of that other than putting some of its games on PC years and years after it got its money out of it on PlayStation. So um, I wouldn't, I'm not angry with Microsoft yet. I guess is the best way I would put it. If they keep traveling down this path too much farther, then the, the red lights start going off and I get a little more concerned about it. All right, thanks to everyone who showed up for today's Zoom call for Ask Shane Anything for January, 2022. If you're interested in doing it with us in February, just make sure you pledge at patreon.com slash sifted at $7 per, uh, per month or more. 
and you can be a part of our awesome Zoom call and our little podcast that we do here. So thanks everyone for being a part of this month's show and we'll see you in February. Thank you.